This video examines the history and evolution of various urban traffic control technologies. We've used traffic signals for a long time. We've had them since at least 1868. Now, this is before widespread adoption of the automobile. People have been playing with automobiles. It is important to note that there were automobiles, buses really, running on the streets of London as early as the 1840s, but they were not allowed to travel very fast for fear of frightening the horses. And the entrenched industries of the day, what we might call the horse lobby, did not want big, large, steam-powered automobiles that make lots of noise and were very combustible, running on the streets. And the horse lobby prevailed for a while. But you still had cross-traffic. You had cross-traffic from pedestrians. You had cross-traffic from horses. You had cross-traffic from horse-pulled omnibuses and horse cars. And if you move ahead a couple of decades to the late 1800s, you had cross-traffic from electrically-powered streetcars. So the idea of controlling traffic in a busy city was very important. The idea was just adopted from the railways, which had been using semaphores and signals in a variety of ways. Electric traffic signals started emerging in the early 20th century. You'll recall from American history class, I hope, Henry Ford was starting to mass produce the Model T automobile in 1908 on the modern assembly line. As you started to see more cars on roads going at higher speeds than people or horses, traffic control became more urgent. Police were used to control traffic, but the idea of the automatic policeman, which was actually one of the terms that was used for the traffic light, came about. It was a relatively simple mechanical signal which would say stop and move, and there would be some light bulb behind it. It would just oscillate back and forth between the green light and the red light. And notice the shed, so the policeman would have a place to stay to keep dry. Traffic towers started to become common in U.S. cities in the 1910s and 1920s, giving officers a better view than ground level shed could. In 1917, Detroit installed the first traffic tower in the United States at the intersection of Woodward Avenue and Michigan Avenue. William Potts, a policeman working for the city of Detroit, developed what we have come to recognize as the modern traffic signal with three faces, red, yellow, and green. Notice that he was working for the police department because traffic control was a police function. We still have police officers to direct traffic. Often, off-duty police officers are directing traffic at big event sites where there's a belief that police officers will somehow do a better job than traffic signals. However, there's no empirical evidence that police officers direct traffic more efficiently than traffic signals, yet people still like having police officers around. If you're at a concert or a busy shopping mall on a Saturday afternoon in a busy shopping season, you'll get police officers moving traffic in and out. The whole system of traffic control merged, emerged out of the police function of the state rather than where it is today in the public works function. We have electrically powered automated policemen, but the idea occurred that if you have a bunch of city blocks in a row, you don't want each of these operating independently. It's much better to have them operate in a systematic way, because what you can do is develop progression. In 1922, a progressive traffic system was developed in New York City. The idea is you have a series of streets which have red signals and green signals that are not turning red at the same time and not, and, and not turning green at the same time. But the first one turns green, and then a few seconds later, the next one turns green. And then a few seconds after that, the third turns green. And a few seconds is based on the speed that you want traffic to travel and the distance between those two places so that you can get what is called a green wave. If you're driving the speed limit on a coordinated corridor, you get a lot of green lights in a row. Once you get out of a green light and then you're discharged, you should be able to make a number of traffic lights in a row. If you drive too fast, you hit a red light. If you drive too slowly, you also hit a red light. Speed, of course, is distance over time, so the slope of this curve, where streets are a measure of distance, is 1 over speed, or pace. If you were to drive at about twice the speed limit, you might get a green wave as well, as shown by the bright green lines. But if the speed limit is 30 miles an hour, I'm not advising you to drive 60 miles an hour. I'm just saying that you might also get a green wave if you were to do so. Signal progression works very well on a regular grid network. Left turns can make it more complicated. People going straight should be able to catch the green light for an extended period, maybe all the way across downtown Minneapolis or all the way across downtown Manhattan. Originally in the 1920s, traffic signals were all fixed time. This used to be a bunch of electric circuits controlled by electromechanical switches. In newer systems, this is now electronic and controlled by computers. While many signals remain fixed time, some are actuated and depend on traffic levels. This is an example of a signal schedule for San Francisco in 1929. You can see the green waves operate in both directions, so long as travelers maintain speeds of 14 and a half miles per hour. But there are a few bends requiring speed changes. The most widely used traffic counting device, aside from a human with a notepad and stopwatch, is the pneumatic tube counter. Trafo data was founded by Bill Gates and Paul Allen while they were in high school. It was their first business collaboration. 
They transformed pneumatic tube road counter output tapes into punch cards and then processed it on an Intel 8008 microprocessor. I wonder whatever happened to them. Actuation is an important idea. Maybe you want to be able to change the light to green if there's a car waiting at a traffic light and there are no or few cars on the cross street and keep it red otherwise. So we developed what's called actuation. How do we know there's a car there? One of the early ideas was to have a horn actuated signal back in 1926 by Charles Adler. So the driver would honk the horn and then the light would change. What's the problem with this? It's really loud. So this is not a technology that took off. You can still see it in places. There's some parking ramps or garages where you blow the horn and then the gate will open. Not just because there's somebody inside opening the garage door, there's actually a mechanism. But you don't want to have that in the city because it can get really loud. In the 1920s, Henry Haw developed a detector that sensed the pressure of passing vehicles. The vehicles caused two metal strips to touch, which closed an electric circuit. Today, an induction loop is an electromagnetic communication or detection system, which uses a moving magnet to induce an electric current in a nearby wire. When a large metal object like a car or truck or even a bicycle goes over the loop, the signal lets the traffic controller know there is a vehicle present. The existence of the vehicle and how long the vehicle is over the loop can be valuable information. This is less disruptive to the oral environment of the city, but it requires expensive saw cuts in the road. Autoscope, developed by Panos Mikolopoulos at the University of Minnesota, is a high-resolution video camera which is hardware and software enabled to detect the presence or absence of cars on a particular stretch of roadway. It does not require cutting the pavement to install, but instead can be mounted on an overhead pole. The quality of pedestrian actuated signals is another example. These are really, really annoying because often there's no reason that the pedestrian should have to push the button. You could look at the lights here, and a brand new intersection, it probably works because Public Works just put it in. But why does it take 11 lines of text to explain how to push a button? In fact, we have many pedestrian actuated buttons that don't work. There was a study done in New York City which found that most pedestrian actuator buttons, the buttons you press to change the traffic signal to give you a pedestrian phase, didn't work, and most of them hadn't worked for more than 30 years, so people tended to ignore them. New York just gave a pedestrian phase to all the movements anyway, so pushing the button didn't matter. They reset the traffic signal timings, and they just didn't bother to pull the buttons out. So New Yorkers wouldn't push the buttons, because they either knew this officially or knew this informally. But people from out of town, visitors, would just stand there and push buttons. But if the actuator breaks, does anybody go and report it and then fix it? Well, the next time somebody from Public Works goes out and looks at the site, they might notice, oh, pedestrian in indicator broken, install a new one. For example, in my walk home, I found the pedestrian actuator that was just a cable out of the pipe which doesn't do anything. It was broken. So I walked across the street when there are no cars coming, like any sensible person would. It might be illegal, but there's nobody there to arrest me, so I guess it's okay. However, when it does work, even though you're standing there, the light doesn't automatically change for you. A car doesn't have to push a button. Why should a person have to push a button? Now, the reason is that traffic signals don't automatically give the pedestrian phase. They only want to give a car a 6-second phase or a 12-second phase, and a pedestrian requires 18 seconds to cross the street at a 3-foot-per-second walking speed. The engineers don't want to cause delay to the cars there because of a pedestrian who's not there. That's one reason to make a pedestrian actuated, when you have a low-volume movement. But often this is not really the issue, and they could just make it a longer phase and make it automatic if they wanted to. Another reason is to shorten the conflicting red light in a semi-actuated or actuated intersection by letting the controller know that there is demand, in this case a pedestrian, on the cross street. Coordinated adaptive traffic systems, such as SCATs, developed in the 1970s at Sydney, synchronize traffic signals to optimize traffic flow over an area based on real-time conditions. It automatically adjusts cycle lengths, splits, and offsets to minimize traffic delay. There are a variety of traffic controllers. The most common are NEMA controllers, referred to as TS1 and TS2. NEMA stands for the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, which establishes a variety of standards. Others include Type 170, which was an open architecture controller developed in the 1960s. Manufacturers adopted this standard, but then attempted to implement proprietary add-ons. Type 2070 was developed first by Caltrans in 1992 and deployed in Los Angeles. It maintained backward compatibility with the 170 and has an open architecture as well. The idea is to be able to replace the software without changing the hardware. Hardware and software are sold separately, so standards are important. The operating system is a microware embedded OS 9. The 2070 is a type of advanced transportation controller, or ATC, blessed by ASHTO, ITE, and NEMA. ASHTO is the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, the Organization of State DOTs, 
and ITE is the Institute of Transportation Engineers, the Organization of Traffic Engineers. These controllers sit in cabinets by the side of the road. The cabinet is a big green or brown or silver box. It is, of course, designed to be waterproof and operate in extreme conditions. Inside of the cabinet is a controller equipment that controls the sequence, duration, and logic of traffic signal timing. You might think it's a computer and that it should get smaller over time. There are computers in there, but these are long-lived infrastructures. Controllers might be out in the field for 30 or 40 or 50 years. If they're not updated, they're using technology from 30, 40, or 50 years ago in some cases, which is very simple. It's electrical or electromechanical and not electronic. Now, the advantage is that electrical can be more reliable. The cables are surprisingly big. They're controlling fairly large lights, and they have to do it reliably in outdoor conditions with temperatures ranging from minus 30 to plus 130 Fahrenheit. There's probably a wider range of extreme temperatures than your typical electronic device will be reliable for. They can be programmed with high-technology user-friendly interfaces. Another idea is transit signal priority. The idea behind transit preemption is that a transit vehicle will be able to change the signal from red to green as it approaches, regardless of what other conditions are going on. This kind of priority is used for emergency vehicles. Sadly, emergency vehicles all too frequently crash into each other when they come from different approaches, and each of them thought they were going to get to change the light to green, and only one of them could because the light can only be green in one direction at a time. So preemption raises safety issues if the driver of the vehicle believes that the preemption will occur automatically and there's a condition under which it doesn't. Priority is more like extending the green light a little bit longer if it's green. This is similar to what an actuator will, will do, but maybe you can call it from instead of being two seconds away from the intersection, maybe it's three seconds or four seconds or five seconds away from the intersection. Transit signal priority requires modern controllers. The driver logs on with a mobile data unit a transponder is read by an antenna, verified by a reader unit. The reader sends bus information to a TPR generator, which determines if the bus is eligible for priority. It compares against criteria set by a traffic engineer or transit manager. If it is eligible, the TPR generator places a control to the tra traffic controller. The traffic controller initiates a strategy to give bus priority treatment. Priority may or may not be granted. Conditions include things like whether there is adequate time to clear the intersection from conflicting movements, pedestrians, the presence of other priority calls, or even signal preemptions from emergency vehicles. Instead of actuating something in the roadway, it sends a signal to a radio or receiver associated with a traffic signal saying, hold the green, I'm coming and I'll be there shortly. And that looks to the green longer than it otherwise would have been. And this helps keep transit vehicles moving. Now, why is it important to keep transit vehicles moving compared to other types of vehicles? Because they carry more people. So if you're thinking about this in terms of value of time, you want to give priority to vehicles that carry the most people. We make the assumption in transportation that all travelers have the same value of time. Or in surface transportation, we make the assumption that all people have the same value of time. So a transit vehicle with 50 people on board is more valuable than a single occupant vehicle with one person on board. You could always say, but if that one person is Bill Gates, he has a really high value of time. And that might be true, but we have no way of knowing who the person is in the car. We can imagine a technology that would allow us to infer people's value of time, but in the real world, we don't do that now. One of the things that we want to do in timing is minimize overall delay. In practice, we'd want to minimize the weighted person delay, where we were measuring the number of people who were in each vehicle, and we would weight it by how much they cared about that delay. So ideally, we would consider that people had different values of time, but that's hard to do. Somewhat more practically, we would consider that people who are waiting two minutes, an additional second is more burdensome than someone who hasn't waited at all. We would try to consider that, but that's a little bit beyond what we can do in practice. So we limit cycle lengths in order to keep people from waiting too long for a period of time. When we're minimizing the delay, we're looking basically at what we have to come up with, and then what are the formulas for delay? A topic for the next video.